Hello, and welcome to the Family Histories podcast, the show for and about those of us who are sat quietly in libraries, archives and spare rooms all around the world, tirelessly piecing together our collective social and family history. My name is Andrew Martin, I'm a family historian and I'll be your host. In this episode, The Antiquarian, we'll be hearing about my guest's relative who was a somewhat creative family historian, and we'll be trying to find a woman's real identity in 19th century Marylebone in London. So, put down that tithe map, grab a cuppa, and let's meet our guest. My guest today is, of course, a family historian, but he's also an award-winning author and a London tour guide. And as if that's not enough, he's also added to his arsenal of skills the role of official historian of the UK's Chelsea Football Club. So, before he kicks off or shows me the red card, I better introduce my guest, Rick Glanville. Hello, Rick. Welcome to the Family Histories podcast. Uh, It's a real pleasure. I love this podcast, love the series, so... And I love your puns as well. <laughs> well. Well, I put some very special ones in there just for you. So uh, it's a delight to have you on the show. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so the place that we start always in this podcast is to ask you how it was that you got hooked on researching family history. <laughs> well, as you pointed out, I'm a writer. I always call myself a writer and researcher, really. Okay. And in my gap year before uni, I was a library clerk. And I got a bit hooked on the Dewey Decimal System (laughs) and (laughs) categorisation of books, the order of things and making sure all things are connected and in their proper place. And as a writer, I really enjoyed researching. So if I was was a music journalist for The Guardian and a music editor at City Limits and a few other things, and I would always pride myself on trying to research facts that maybe people didn't know about the person I was about to interview. And there were some great people, Gil Scott Heron, uh, Anita Baker, some fantastic wow. people that I got to interview, and I was very lucky. But research was always at the base of it, and it still is. Mm-hmm. And um, how I got into family history was really through my mum, because I was working at, as I say, I was a music editor at City Limits in the late 80s, and that's based in Clerkenwell, just off um, Jerusalem Passage near Clerkenwell Green. Okay. And for those people that used to do the pre-internet research that was a bit of a golden area for family history and that you had the family records center right nearby and my mum who was very keen on family history research said to me look can you meet me one lunchtime at the family history center because she'd been there and she said you know there are all these people hurling these huge volumes of ledgers like censuses and and other huge books slamming them down down on the desks and she felt a bit intimidated so I suppose I was a sort of um I don't know uh, uh, the the heavy to help her doing her research at the family history (laughs) centre and um so she was looking up her her family names which her her maiden name's Boddington and yes they're connected to the Boddingtons of Boddington's Brewery which is quite amazing and Bassett so we did sort of look at her interests and then once we'd done that I thought you know what I'm going to look up my surname my dad's name Glanville and I started to look and I found in the 1851 census that we knew that they were from like Barnsbury Islington around that area Mm -hmm. but I found a presence in Clerkenwell where they ran a tailor's shop cut a long story short Mm -hmm. it turned out that my family had arrived about 120 years earlier in Clerkenwell and they ran a tailor shop for almost 100 years uh, that I had no idea about that I walked past every day on my way to work. Wow. So it's quite astonishing. And I think once, you know, it's things like that that quite often trigger a fascination because you think, wow, if I can, if you know, it's just a tailor. It's not like a king or a queen or some of these things that you see on who do you think you are, you know, the people that want royalty and everything. It's just tangible. Yeah. The physical property was still there. The, and I managed to find a photo of it with Glanville and Son Taylor on it. And wow, that blew my mind. So really, I was what, um, about 25 uh, when that happened. And so I joined the Society of Genealogists because I'm a joiner. 
and started to research using all this. Remember the CDs and microfiches and all these things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, microfiche. <laughs> Microfilms <laughs> and, um, and books. Wow. He remembers books. You know, I mean, it's so brilliant. I'm a massive fan of technology advances in my work and in my research. So it's much, much better now and much easier. Yeah. But, you know, whether we're missing some of the wrinkles because it's ciphered through that uh, technology, I wonder. That's true. So really, that's, that's uh, my story and I started to look at the Glanvilles go back and back and then I suddenly found this amazing resource that I thought was really going to help me we'll come on to that in a minute but I'm absolutely I probably do some research almost every day uh, alongside my main work wow do the Glanvilles kind of stray beyond Clark and well are they kind of seated somewhere else or? yeah another strange coincidence my parents started to take us on holiday to um, South Devon mm-hmm. And um, they loved it so much that they decided to move there when on, re- on retirement. Okay. And it turns out that our Glanville family hails from uh, about sort of 20 miles away from where they moved to, <laughs> uh, which was a bit strange. The Glanville family that branch we have is from Ashburton in Devon, which is beautiful market town on the periphery of, of Dartmoor. Absolutely fantastic place. Nice. And so, you know, we go there every now and then and there's a churchyard with lots of our family gravestones in it mm-hmm. from the 1700s which is wonderful and Glanville is in all its uh, varieties now my name is spelt without an e so it's G-L-A-N-V-I-L-L everyone wants to put an e on the end of it yeah. and we're pretty obsessed us non-e's <laughs> about <laughs> putting people right but Another thing about family history is it's a bonfire of your vanities that you think you're precious about something like a spelling, but you'll soon you soon realise that your surname has been uh, filtered down and changed and uh, butchered. Abs- absolutely, <laughs> and DNA has shown me empirically that I come from Glanville, Granville, Grenville, Grenville. Glanfield, all sorts. I've got DNA connections to people with that surname in their tree. Yeah, uh, go, and that's all around the West Country mostly, like oh, Launceston, St Justin, Cornwall, as I say, yeah. Ashburton, Exeter, Totnes, all these kinds of areas. You'll find us um, ne'er do wells and strays. <laughs> oh, and Tavistock, I should say. Yeah. So back when you were being the the heavy and helping <laughs> your mother, were there were there other relatives who were interested in this family research, or was it just basically your mother and you by kind of initially proxy? That's a good question, actually, because you know that thing where you know when you're really into family history, and it's a bit like golf. You know, every mm-hmm. walk you go on, you ruin by. <laughs> by saying, I just want to nip into this church or (laughs) this churchyard or, you know, there's a missing manor house somewhere around here that I've got to look at. Oh, God, why? (laughs) Every time. Um, But no, they do, I I think, they're particularly interested in some of the social history stories and where where our family members uh, were involved in events that are are historic. There's lots of Glanvilles who were eminent, you know, at... Lots of judges and speakers of the House of Commons and mm-hmm. a philosopher and a naked lepidopterist um, <laughs> that are very interesting. My dad was really interested in that side of it, okay. my late father. He loved all of that side, you know, and telling his neighbours about, oh, yeah, yeah, we, my ancestor was a speaker under Charles I and things like that. <laughs> uh, whereas I think the rest of the family are more interested in people that were uh, involved in some of the major changes that were occurring in society and how uh, their lives reflected that. Sure, more of the kind of ordinary lives that people lead and how they adjust it, yeah. Yeah, and the fascinations within that. Yeah, and, you know, just how they live their lives and and some of the th- things that you sort of work out, how relationships worked or how when they did things, why did they do it? Why did they move 200 miles? Why did they go into the Navy? You know, these kinds of things. And yeah. why did they... Why did they have a bigamous uh, relationship with someone? I had that quite recent, <laughs> like relatively recent generation, like um, living relatives who were oh. parts of this of a bigamous 
uh, from a bigamous uh, cousin. Oh, okay. That's that's a bit awkward. But fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> and a tip for people, if they do encounter a, a situation like that, the strategy I took was to not approach, or initially approach the people that directly involved themselves, but after that to look at the next generation. So the one, they're a generation removed from all of the shenanigans and for them, it's more a fascination than anything to be yeah. upset or private about. Yes. And that that's how it worked. We managed to yeah. reconcile the two sides of the family through the children. Yeah. So aside from uncovering uh, bigamous relationships, what's your favourite part of researching? Oh, I think, like most people, I'm, I suppose I'm quite a competitive researcher, so I like to find something out that other people didn't know, something quite significant, like find... A marriage or find that a name was that they, someone used a middle name instead of a first name and that's why you couldn't find them and things like that so I, I suppose it's that discovery the nugget the easter egg <laughs> that uh, you really look for but also I think just a, again looking at why people lived like they did trying to walk a sort of mile in their shoes i mean there's some really interesting people in in my family history there's a like a jamaican woman who married one of my fourth or fifth cousins back uh, back in the sort of late 1700s who uh when he died there was a, a doubt about whether they'd married and she produced the marriage details uh, but this wasn't believed so this woman of color from jamaica came to england took on the english establishment went to court and fought to win the estate from her late husband's family because they'd taken it over. So, and I, I, you know, I'm a great believer that what you need to find or what you want to find is out there. You just know exactly where to look. Yeah. And just, and persevere. And what I found was that not only did she move to this sleepy part of East Devon called Bradninch and claim the estate, but I found a diary of a local retired military man who knew her very well and described her. So you've, there's a contemporary description of her wow. wandering around Devon and what a, a, an incredible personality she was that she would get up first thing in the morning and go and catch loads of fish and be walk, seen walking through the through Bradninch. You know, and everyone knew that. She, and also she cut down a whole forest because she needed money. And that caused a big stink. Not something I would subscribe to being very green myself, but fascinating personality. So you did, you know, you can find a diary that you wouldn't know that this person had written no, about her. No, not at all. But I just happened upon it, read through it, saw that he'd met her and described her quite well. So in answer to your question, Andrew, do you know what my favourite bit about family histories? Being lucky. Well, who doesn't <laughs> want to be lucky when they're researching? Quite right, no one. But it is my favourite thing. I just love being lucky. And are you lucky when you are researching, perhaps when you're doing your your work as a tour guide as well? Do your, do your research skills come in handy for that? Yeah. Uh, again, you know, when you're doing the course, obviously you're, there's a, a cohort of you mm -hmm. and you see the different ways that people approach things. Some people just kind of go for the main points and the obvious stuff and, and they're and do that really brilliantly and it's more about their presentation and you know giving covering all the points uh, that you need to on that particular yeah. uh, walk now my domain is Clerkenwell and Islington in London so so partly I mean you're not supposed to do this a lot but you know I was able to say that's where Crufts was first held you know this is on, on Liverpool Road in Islington that's where Crufts was first held okay and 20 yards down the road is where I was born. You know, <laughs> you're not supposed to do things like that. But I'm much more, more usually, I use the research skills I've learnt through family history and the kind of sources mm -hmm. that maybe other people don't know because, you know, you archive.org is just the most amazing resource. And um, I use that really, really regularly and find lots of fascinating stuff on there because it's basically tens of thousands of, of books scanned and the optical character recognition has been done on that so you can search for text. And I just try and find more of the highways and byways rather than the main roads when I'm doing my tour guiding, as well as covering all the main main points. But I like 
uh, little stories, human stories that I that I find that I haven't heard before. I like the sound of a tour that's acknowledging perhaps the the big hitters, as in the large events or significant places that people would perhaps recognise from history. But then you're layering in this undercurrent of life, essentially, with with the everyday other yeah. historical events or context that that just doesn't make it into that those kind of topics. Absolutely. As the official historian of Chelsea Football Club, what kind of things do you research or preserve? For them, are they kind of footballer or club histories and all kinds of sources? Yeah, well, one thing you, that you should know, Andrew, and the people out there, the listeners, sports organisations have no respect, even though they claim they respect their history, they have no respect for their past, really. Okay. Um, when I took over at uh, as club historian at Chelsea, the club had like one accounts ledger, um, a couple of photographs, uh, one player's contract and that was about it okay in the 80s they just had a room full of all the their archive just like piled up and people would just walk in and nick stuff from it uh, all the minute books from 1905 when the club was founded up until uh, 1982 when there was a change of ownership all of those minute books were loaned to someone who was writing a book right and he kept them so our heritage has long gone so it's been a, a mission of mine and several others at the club to sort of really real rebuild that we've got a great museum there but in terms of family history what I brought to the history of the club was to research all of the players and the board members and I've built a family tree of all of these people because I again you know you, you know how it is Andrew you don't really know know people until you know where what their forebears did yeah. what how that what circumstances they grew up in before they became a public figure um you know where did they come from was there anything in their family that would have uh, influenced them in the career choice that they took okay and i think that was something that i would not fo other football historians weren't quite doing that to the same degree that i was and um it was taken on by there's a Chelsea Graves Society and they research every single Chelsea player grave from first team, juniors, whatever, to reserves. Anyone who played for Chelsea, a women's team, anyone who played for them, they find their grave and they, they've mapped it. And so you can see how football and I think sports generally are embracing the power of uh, family history research. Yeah, I'm only aware of one other sports historian uh, and that's a lady called Margaret Roberts. Mm. But I've not heard her yet talk about football. I think I've only heard her speak about tennis and swimming. So I was I was curious as to whether there were many sports historians or sports kind of archives around at all, or whether it's quite fragmented. It is very fragmented. Um, people tend to put lots of research into books, okay, because supporters buy books. And there are some really good museums. I've got reasonable relationships with my colleagues at Arsenal and Orient and Man United, and people. You know, we we exchange our research and and uh, join together. But fans do it do it best. There's a lot of of you know infamously known as anoraks, people that are obsessed with players and you know their goals and matches played and things like that. That um, it's just an extension of that to work out. The, the kind of the genealogical side of that but it's part of being you know you're a, you're a fanatic of of a of a team so you you know you take that fanaticism into an area that you're comfortable in and lots of people now are comfortable in family history research now that so much is available online and to loop back to family history uh what would you like to see the um, genealogy community evolve into in the next kind of few years how where do you think it should go well <laughs> I, it's really interesting. I think DNA is, is is still. I mean, it's changed everything, but I think mm. there's so much more potential for DNA to help family historians work out break break down some of their brick walls and and stuff. And I do every now and then. I'm not saying I support it, but I do wonder whether hard up churchyards are going to start allowing access to old graves so that people can do dna testing on old bones i know that's a terrible thing to think but um in my imagination an ethical uh, headache there it will be i think there will be a, a quandary on some of these things i think there are some taboos that will probably come down but 
I'd like to see I'd like to see much more rigor in people's family trees, frankly. Fair enough. Because I think that's something that uh, there almost should be a a kind of um, kite mark for family trees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, I don't think uh, people that have their DNA tested should be allowed to not put a tree up, <laughs> even, even a private one. <laughs> so lots of frustrations that I think probably... As we, you know, we're learning so much more. Just look at the advances in, a, in ancient DNA. Yeah, I would love to see more um, ancient DNA put up for match with matches with, you know, current uh, humans roaming the earth. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I would love to see more of that. <laughs> While we research our family trees, we often stumble across some fascinating characters. The kindly, the rebel, the humble, and those who have done some dastardly deeds. In this part of the show, my guest will pick one of their most fascinating relatives and tell their life story. So, Rick, who are you going to introduce us to? Uh, well, the person I want to introduce you to is the ostentatiously named William Ermston Searle Glanville Richards. That's quite a name. Who's actually my third cousin, three times removed okay and was originally a bit of a hero of mine as i mentioned i had done family history research uh, particularly on the glanville family since the mid 80s before the internet was a thing yeah and while i was doing this research i'd occasionally see a book referred to called records of the anglo-norman house of glanville Ooh. it turned out once i'd looked into this that it'd been published in 1883 and it was a godsend uh-huh. now I'd traced through censuses, the old CDs, CD yeah, noms. I think I've probably still got some. I'd managed to work out my family had come from Ashburton in Devon. And uh, through looking at the records, the vital records there, church records, I knew I'd gone back as far as an Edward Glanville, who appeared to be the, was as far back as I could go. And I couldn't work back any further than that right, okay. now stumbling upon this book or actually getting to look at it properly it was an extraordinary body of work by this um, William Glanville Richards who actually in 1883 he was in his mid-twenties and again you know the amount of research that had gone into it and the sourcing and how well organised it was and he drew the heraldry himself and it was just a Brilliant, just an absolute treasure. I thought, my God, this is just, you know, it mapped the, uh, the Glanville family, including Edward, uh, our oldest known ancestor up till that point, going right back to before uh, the conquest. So it's said about the, you know, the Glanvilles came over with uh, William the Conqueror and all this sort of stuff. So you're thinking, oh my God, brilliant, my work is done. Yeah. This car drives itself. Lovely. Um, but then, as I started to look into more, you know, going through the book and adding things to my tree, I started to notice there were bits that weren't quite right. Oh. So I mentioned before, you know, like this Edward, according to this book, was like a gateway to an unbelievable host of the illustrious 16th, 17th century West Country ancestors, John Glanville, a Tavistock judge, whose memorial is in St Eustatius Church in Tavistock. It's a Great memorial. Uh, his son, John, who was Speaker under Charles I during the short Parliament. Okay. Joseph Glanville, who was a philosopher, ghost hunter, who predicted the mobile phone and the, the internet, amazingly. And Eleanor Glanville, who I mentioned earlier, who was the naked lepidopterist, <laughs> uh, the lady of the butterfly she was known as in Somerset, and many more. And so uh, we'd visit all these places and we were thinking, wow, we have this Amazing, quite serious. I've got reproductions of paintings of, of two of the ancestors. Very nice. Well, all great so far. But as I became more experienced and rigorous and the internet arrived, I started to notice, I started to have doubts about Glanville Richards's work. Some of it was too convenient. There were impossible dates. Oh. Some misidentified individuals, because my research by now had started to sort of supersede his and the nagging worry that I had was that I looked everywhere trying to find a baptism for Edward Glanville. Now, Glanville Richards gives the baptism date. 
Now, you know, that thing about if you're going to lie, lie with detail. And I think that's what he's done here. Oh, dear. That's what my conjecture was. And I know it was during the interregnum, 1660, when he was born, when lots of parishes didn't record vital events for various reasons. They didn't have a, a vicar or whatever, but it was a concern. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> the killer moment was when I was doing some Googling and I saw a reference to Glanville Richards. So the man who'd created this fantastic tome with all our history in it, that he was a convicted felon for, wait for it, defacing public property (laughs) at the British Library. Wow. (laughs) So it's really sort of, you're thinking to yourself, right, (laughs) can't get any worse. Now, it's important to point out that probably 98% of the research he did was fantastic and really helpful. Okay. But the vital 2% is the killer. Mm. And it wasn't just our family, because the trial reports are very damning. Um, he was a training to be a cleric, and he seems to have been touting his research skills around the great and the good, who were, right. you know, this, there was this explosion, obviously, of interest in family history. And there was a descendant of the Leet family, that's L-E-T-E. Um, he contacted them and said he could write a book similar to the Glanville Tome. And he showed some links to the Leet family that he thought were missing from this person's research. Unfortunately for Glanville Richards, the client or potential client already had a genealogist on the case. Right. Okay. And the genealogist smelled a rat. <laughs> so he checked the original documents that Glanville Richards was citing in situ at the British Library. And he realised that they'd been overwritten. So they'd got a pen and ink out and he'd overwritten links to families and and all of this stuff and added to... Now, don't forget, right, this is not some person's family tree that he's overwriting. He's taken the Harlin, the bedrock oh. pedigrees oh. at the British Library and overwritten them, created new generations, new citations, new connections. So that was in 1890. I am bleeding inside from this. <laughs> it's just horrific. And that was 1890. And by 1893, the British Library had worked out, you know, they'd got the ticketing out and they knew he was to blame. And he was tried at the Old Bailey and in prison for three months without hard labour. Now, I'm disappointed about the without hard labour. If I'd been in there, I would definitely have been pointing yeah. at saying, ain't you going to hang him? <laughs> no, I'm joking. But um, it doesn't end there. Now, once this, it's like a virus that entered the system of our family history research and others. Mm-hmm. So Glanville Richards, brilliant research was swallowed hook, line and sinker by the great and good of late 1800 genealogy. Some of the most important uh, genealogists of the time just swallowed his lines wholesale. So it's been like, you think of that, 1890, now that's all on paper. But everything that's been scanned and everything that's been copied over in the digital age it's spreading like a computer virus, and it's so many people's trees have this error. Yeah, it's just permeating through. These yeah. deliberate, misleading connections. And in fact, I was so concerned that I started to sort of look up, like proactively look up where Glanville Richards might have done this elsewhere. And I went to the Bodleian, and I saw a pedigree that I thought it looks like his handwriting that he'd overwritten. So I informed them and they had an inquiry and they decided to use their new, using their new scanning technology, they'd work out what was overwritten, what, what was underneath. And they were able to restore that. And that's the Bodleian. You know, these are... It's got right to the core. Yeah. You know, the, the heralds, they always say, no, Glanville Richards never visited here because I did ask them. And I pointed out what he'd done. They said, no, he never visited here and he's never changed any of the the relevant uh, pedigrees. But you know what? I became so concerned. I started to wonder about Glanville Richards. Like, what sort of a person was he? And his father, he called it, he hyphenated it Glanville Richards. So there's a, well, you know, there was a, he was trying to sort of have an association with Glanville even in his name. His father had Glanville as a middle name, not as a hyphenated surname. So he's kind of trying to firm up the association himself personally. But I became a bit obsessed with how could how could he have done all of this research in his mid-20s when he yeah. was training to be a cleric? You know, what made him tick? Curious. Funnily enough, lots of his research papers were lodged at a, an archive in Truro. So I went to look at that, and I think they started to sell some of that off. And I bought one of the huge folder of research that he'd done. And it was really quite incredible how, you know, we think 
we're obsessed with family history, but how much harder could it have been to get clippings from newspapers from all around the country? Yeah, and slower as well. Yeah, exactly. He visited local archives, churches. He visited um, relatives who knew the people that he was writing about. He, I mean, it was remarkable. He even had a lock of hair from a distant nephew who died very young in this book. And when I say about DNA testing, that's something Mm. I think people might end up doing, (laughs) testing locks of hair. Definitely, yeah. But I thought maybe he'd researched Edward and would have some research clues that would help me to find this baptism. You know, where did this specific baptism date come from? No clues in there whatsoever. Oh. But there was a letter in an odd handwriting. Like it was a trial for him doing secretarial hand, like a letter, a snippet that sort of tried to lay claim for his family to have been connected to the judges that I've, that I've mentioned all these illustrious ones. So, you know, it's, I think we take for granted when a book looks really authoritative and there's a, there's a copy in the society of genealogists, there's copies in all the big uh, British library as well, but you know, Be careful, because you could have a a Glanville Richards in your um, family history research if you're not careful. Do you think his motivations might have been that he was a young man and he wanted some money and he wanted to train and he wanted to be this good? Or do you think that he, if he's purposely crossing out on original documents, that can't be him just being a bad researcher. That's, That's intent to change records. So was there anything maybe that he was wanting to associate himself with some kind of grand uh, class or aristocracy and he was trying to make himself Mm. a more kind of prominent person. What do you think motivated him? Well, that's really interesting. I think think a psychologist could work it out quite quickly from probably from the book of raw research that I've got. Yeah. Um, I think you're right about finance being a motive. He was charging for these things. If he was maybe having to finance his way training as a cleric he maybe wasn't earning any money so that would have been something and he maybe he thought that he exploit his skills and maybe when there were limitations to that he thought well I'll just you know jump the shark and tell people they have connections to these great uh, great people yeah. and charge them for it but I think you know what's weird is the moral question isn't it about why would you be so keen to connect yourself to judges and all these upstanding people by using like immoral methods of falsifying it just it i think he must be must have been a very complex person and i think i, I never underestimate the power of money when i'm looking at my family history why do people move why do people get ill or always seem to be ill? Why do they go into workhouses and things like that? And, you know, this money is so important yeah. in life, sadly, that um, maybe that was the overriding element. But I think the fact there was also another facet, which was his vanity, that he wanted to have connections to these amazing people. In fact, he regularly wrote letters to local papers If they mentioned something to do with Glanville, he would write and say, oh, my great, 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 great grandfather did this and built that and da, da, da. So the prestige of that connection was obviously something that he got off on. And I think where he realised he could get away with it, having published a book in 1883, that um, maybe he was thinking, God, these these other researchers are rubbish if they don't know that I'm making stuff up. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Maybe he just exploited that. It is quite funny, though, that relatively recently, like a couple of years ago, I stumbled across a review of his book, his original book, and it was really quite damning. It said there's lots of sloppy research in here and lots of non sequiturs and contradictions and things, and I wish I'd seen that review <laughs> uh, at the time I bought the book so that I could have approached it with maybe a bit more scepticism and wouldn't have to remove about 3,000 people from my tree. (laughs) Oh, no. The other thing is that we can only include what we know. And, you know, we know that parish records are incomplete or erroneous. Yeah. And um, that's the much as tempting as it is uh, to 
sort of think <laughs> to think baptism records and marriage records into them and assume them you know we can't you can't do that can you so that's the the, the frustration but again we have to think laterally mm-hmm. you know where can you go to find references so you can you can often find legal cases quite often they would interview like local villages to try and find out who's how long have those people lived there? You know, it'd be a, a border dispute and they'll talk to, for want of a better phrase, the local yokels and say, you know, have they always lived there? Say the cats, you know, have the cats always lived there? Oh yeah, they've lived there and then no, so-and-so lived next door and, you know, and we got married on their, on their land. They were very generous. You know, you can quite often get nice vernacular information from, from those, but it's a tortuous yeah. uh, way to go about researching. You just have to be, You know, you just have to keep reading and reading and reading everything for that one tiny useful nugget that you're going to get. Well, I know for one thing that if I see an online tree that contains a Glanville and certainly a Glanville Richards in it, I possibly won't add that to my tree. So I should perhaps avoid that or at least really examine it quite heavily before allowing that to infiltrate my own tree. So thank you, Rick, for telling us the life story of William Ermston Sell Glanville Richards and his wonderful name. But I think it's time for you to face the brick wall. Brick walls are a pain but one that we as family historians must bear from time to time as our trails of clues go cold. Perhaps only for a few hours, or years, or decades, or maybe even forever. So with this in mind, it's time for my guest to share one of his brick walls in a hope that one of you, dear listeners, might just have that clue that turns those bricks into dust. OK, Rick, how can we help? Right. I really hope that some listeners can. Because um, the brick wall for me, or one of many, but uh, the main one, is built behind my great-great-grandmother Ellen, or Eleanor Taylor, who was born around 1846 in Marylebone. Okay. And who, all King's Cross, (laughs) who raised a family with Henry David Linsell, L-I-N-S-E-L-L, in North London in the 1870s. And she died in January 1890, reportedly aged 42, though I believe that's not quite correct. Yeah. Sadly, she was buried in a common grave, so there's no assistance for a gravestone, yeah. and that's the reason I only know 30 of my 32 three-times great-grandparents. Now, I thought I'd identified her. Okay. I had this wonderful tree going back through really interesting supposed ancestors. And then I discovered a death, and it was the same person that I identified as uh, being the daughter of these uh, family that I thought was was mine, so it couldn't be her. So Ellen, or Ellen and I have looked through, tested lots and lots of different families, and none of them match up. They all seem to have, the, the daughter seems to have died very young, and I'm sort of struggling. Okay. Now, her death was reported by a cousin called Harriet Copping, um, nay Gaysford of 25 Penton Place, Clerkenwell. And as I said, she's buried at Islington and Pancras Cemetery. Okay. The fact I can't find a marriage for Ellen and Henry could suggest that one or both had already married and separated but not divorced. And that's something you do, you'll know you come across that quite yeah. regularly. Yeah. But the main reason I'm fascinated by her is that she may hold the key to a DNA mystery for me because around 6% of my DNA has been matched to uh, West or Central Southern Africa. Uh And and my matches who share that inheritance online, you know, my ancestry DNA matches, have a branch each of them really has a branch stemming from this part of the Linsall family tree. Okay. So I'm quite fascinated to know who my African DNA donor is, even though obviously it may well be a horrible story. And I'm a, but I'm a supporter of reparations, to be honest, uh, for the evil of in, enslavement. And um, I'd, if I could identify uh, the parents are the people that gave me this DNA I'd like to sort of try and make some reparation in that respect ideally though Ellen's 
father will be a sailor who came from Ghana or something, or Cameroon, uh, in the late 1780s and not enslaved. Hopefully that will be the, the case. But I'm just keen to t- try and identify who she is so that I can sure. fill that huge slice of uh, cake going back. Because, of course, once you lose one, once you lose two ancestors, it multiplies going back and back and back. So that's what I'm missing out on. OK, so haven't been able to find a marriage between her and Henry Linsell. No. What other documented evidence have you got for her? Because you said that you believe she died in 1890. So she's got some censuses there. Yeah, censuses. So there's nothing before, uh, because I don't know what name she was using. It's it's really difficult to work out whether she was whether Taylor was a married name. I've got this this cousin, Harriet Copping. That's a, I think that's quite a clue. Harriet Copping, her first name was Gaysford, and, you know, that's a, a cousin, so I can work... That's really the most tangible thing, other than her relationship with Henry David Linsell, that I can look at. Right. But it's such a complicated... The Copping and Gaysford tree, again, I've, I've sort of really massively worked that out, and I can't find an Ellen who is a candidate in that tree who could be, who could be a cousin... So it's really quite frustrating. I've spent years on (laughs) trying to bottom (laughs) this out and try and see who who it is. The other thing that's complicated is you know you get a sense about some ancestors that they're covering things up. And that's what I really with Ellen, that she gives or uh, is is given... um, different birth dates, different, uh, this is in the census, and places of birth, you know, Marylebone, King's Cross. I, and I, I know that there are, obviously, uh, that they're adjacent in London. They're adjacent um, uh, places where the registration or baptism could have happened. Yes. But is that covering up? Is it is someone trying to not be found? I, I think that we do... I've I've had quite a few people in other parts of my tree who were very deliberately throwing out flack so that they couldn't be they couldn't be traced. Mm-hmm. I suppose my theory at the moment is that I think she was she had been married, she was separated, she wasn't divorced, that's why they didn't get married and that her surname isn't Taylor. And so I've been looking for that all this time, and um, I should have been really looking at trying to identify what that surn- surname could be rather than Taylor. Yeah, that's hard to search for a, an Ellen or an Eleanor something marrying a someone <laughs> Taylor. I would imagine this, exactly. if you put that search into any kind of search engine or family history website, you're going to get a few results for that. Um, I was curious as to whether Lincel is spelt incorrectly. I can imagine that's a name that gets a few variants. Oh, you're so right. Exactly. So sometimes that has a D in it in the middle. So Lincel. Sometimes it's spelt with a C. Okay. Sometimes uh, with one L. And uh, again, this is something obviously is as researchers we come across all the time. Yeah. And you just have to make, you know, you, you have to search broadly. Um, and with precision and work out where you can go. I mean, I tell you, I'm really pleased that the General Records Office now is allowing a certain number of certificates to be sent out on email for £2.50 each. That's a real boon. Yeah. It's fantastic, isn't it? And I, I really hope that not just me, that other people who are researching the same family can, you know, benefit from that whereas you would say oh seven pound fifty is a bit much just to sort of prove something wrong. for a gamble it's a bit borderline as to whether you could just go yeah okay it's, it's only seven pounds fifty yes it's, it's a bit harder than it's only two pounds fifty i mean it's yeah. still two pounds fifty but it's less of a gamble absolutely and it's i think it is that it's that impulse as well isn't it that you think no i need to know now and i'm going to find out now yeah. i think that's the other thing about it is that it's instant that you get it straight away you don't have to wait a week or five days or whatever yeah that's good obviously the other route that i can take is looking through dna now i'm really not a dna expert Uh, i wish i was something in my brain that just can't quite process how it works and how you know how i should go about picking out the element of my dna that i think would help me and to sort of try and match that what's it dna painting and things like this 
I'm really not good at that. Okay. So um, it's a real weakness. Yes, so maybe yeah. I should do a course in that and maybe that would un- unlock that and some of my other brick walls. I was curious as well. So you mentioned Harriet was listed as a cousin, but was this Harriet listed as her cousin or is she Henry's cousin? And, and have you got a source that determines which? That's a really great question because it was something that I, I thought well, after I'd spent uh, months just uh, assuming that uh, Harriet was a cousin of hers, I suddenly had that light bulb moment. Oh, God, maybe I should have looked at Linsel. But it's, there's no Linsel connection there either. So I'm going back to my other hypothesis, which is that there's an Ellen connected to the Coppings and Gaysfords that I haven't identified yet that became a tailor. You know, I've looked up Gaysford, Copping, Taylor, you know, for marriages and things, and I haven't had any success on that okay and also there are about uh, i think three or four other ellen or ellen taylors who were born around that time so in the you know the uh, gro has has them listed and one of them and again this is something that we all know we must do but sometimes we forget uh, was ellen or eleanor was that the middle name so i found one for example that I thought maybe, well, I think, you know, a eureka moment right. of Emily Ellen Ann Taylor, born in 1846 in Marylebone. And um, but again, she died in 1856. So there's another dead end. To complicate things, Henry David Linsell sometimes signed or sometimes was listed as Henry David, sometimes Henry, sometimes David. And I think even, you know, sometimes... When you think about family relationships, the formal name might be Henry David Linsall, but if he's the son of a Henry, he might be called David or he might choose to call himself David to differentiate himself rather than be Henry Jr. These are all the things that we have to factor in, these cat's cradles of clues, you know. Well, for a moment, let's imagine, say, that you have access to... I don't know, like a time machine or something. And there was like a date and a place that you could go to to kind of ask this question to the right people at the right time back in history. What date and kind of where would you pick? Well, I think I would have to go to January 1890, a few days before Ellen dies, and ask Henry, so this is in Islington, and ask Henry if Eleanor was incapacitated and couldn't answer her for herself. What's her story? Tell me all about her. That's what I would be doing. Okay. So what's the best way for our listeners to contact you if they think that they have a a clue or a research idea? I'm on Twitter, or X as it's now known, for the... For (laughs) For this week? Exactly, for for the foreseeable future, I suppose. And that's at Rick Glanville, R-I-C-K-G-L-A-N-V-I-L-L. Or I'm happy for people to know my email address, which is rick.glanville at gmail.com. Lovely. And remember, no E at the end of Glanville. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, listeners can also head over to familyhistoriespodcast.com where they can read this episode's show notes or they can send us an email at hello at familyhistoriespodcast.com and we'll pass it on to Rick. Now, whilst those listeners go scurrying off to look for clues without an E, uh, I think I might just be able to help you crack this one. Wow, amazing. Yeah. But you're going to need to follow me through to the garage. Oh, okay. Here we are. Oh, wow, this is just like my basement. (laughs) I can assure you that this is not like anyone's basement. No, 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 it's fine. Honestly, Andrew, I've seen it much worse. So what exactly are we looking for? Sorry? This is what we're looking for. Uh, what? That? I I mean, what is it? This is a state-of-the-art, fully operational, highly scientifically calibrated secret time machine. Oh, oh, you're serious? Very. And this over here is my assistant, Shandor Patofi. Hello, Shandor. Hello. Um, just one thing. I thought you were going to help me find some old files and documents and break down a brick wall. No, no, I can do better than that. If you go and sit in that seat over there... Oh, and watch yourself on that cable. Yep, that's it. Then Shandor and I can adjust a few settings and send you back in time for you to solve that brick wall first hand. How does that sound? Well, 
I'm not really convinced, but look, I'll play on this. Perfect. Now, remind us of the date and place of your brick wall. 20th of January, 1890. The Royal Free Hospital, Liverpool Road, Barnsbury and Islington, please. Okay, let me just set this. We are set. Great. Now you'll need this temporal beacon, and you'll just need to press that button on the top when you want to come home. Oh, that, no, that all looks great, yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay, here we go. Rick Glanville, without an E. Thank you, goodbye, and good luck. Everything okay? He is in Leeds. Leeds? Well, it's close-ish. And the date? It says offside. What does that mean? Offside? I've no idea. The Family Histories podcast was presented and produced by me, Andrew Martin. My guest was the brilliant Rick Glanville with John Spike as Shandor Patofi. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd love you to leave us a review or share it with your friends. Thank you for listening. Approximately no family historians were harmed in the making of this podcast.